service and is honoring the will of God today as we bow in humble submission to his will and extend to the bereaved family our deepest sympathies. We want to encourage, we want you to be encouraged and assured that God is with you during this difficult time and in him you can find comfort, healing, and unbelievable peace that surpasses all understanding. There is no pain that our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ cannot feel and no sorrow that he cannot heal. He is the author and the finisher of our faith. Humbly submitted, Liberty Baptist Church, Reverend Clyde Bennett, Jr. Pastor, Sister Helen Gross Murray, Church Secretary. Amen. Thank you for those resolutions. And now we will have special tributes coming from Mother's oldest daughter, Lavinia Coates. Amen. Come on, sis. You got this. Mama told you what to do. You just got to do it. Somebody once said, when your mama tell you to do something, you do it. That's the only reason I'm standing here. All right. Y'all excuse me, I had to write things down because I know how I am when I, that's my heart over there. Amen. That was my running buddy. We got in trouble a lot, but hey. <laughs> Lord, let me live until my children are grown. How many times did I hear her say that? The story of Cosetta Mack Cox. She asked me, Lavinia, when she could be called Lavinia. When she was okay with me, it was Vinny. That was my pet name. She called me Vinny. When she was upset with me, it was Lavinia. <laughs> and when she said, when she called me Miss Coates, oh, I know I had to. I had to. <laughs> When my mother's health started failing, she would talk about the things she wanted on her home going. And of course, at first, I, I didn't want to hear it. I, I want to hear your mother's going to die. But a friend of mine that I worked with for me and you, and she said, you need to start listening to her. You need to start writing it down what she wants. And so I did. I started keeping it in my mind what she wanted and trying to forget about myself and think about her. So today I'm standing here to tell her story. Of, I'm telling the story of some of the things she told me. I may miss a few, but I'm trying to do the best I can. Cosetta Mac Cox. One day I asked mom, I said, why do you put your maiden name with your, when you use your name? She said, because that's my name. <laughs> so I never asked that again. <laughs> Cosetta Mac Cox, but we in the family, what did we call her? Cosetta Mac Do Cox. Because when we didn't have everything we needed to do something, and we would complain to mama, family, what would she say? Make do with what you got. Yeah. And that has helped me. When I don't have something, I make do. Okay. I used to call mama when I first got married. Mom, I don't have no baking powder to make biscuits. I don't have to. She said, make pancakes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you don't need baking powder for pancakes. <laughs> mama, I don't have eggs to make cornbread. Make hot corn I bought a cornbread. <laughs> and those would be her words to me. She said, make do with what you have. And that's what I tried to do. My mother never met a stranger. Man. You weren't gonna be around my mother long and not talk to her. I'm telling you. She had three questions you had to answer. Yeah. And ask anybody that has been a provider for my mother, if anybody's in here. Ask anybody that's been at the hospital with her. You had three questions you got to answer. Who are you? Where do you live? And who are your people? I'm telling you, who are your people? You didn't talk to Miss Cox without telling her. 
she would look at them in the hospital and come in there. She said, who are you? Where do you live? Who are your people? Who are your folks? That's what she wanted to know. And you were going to answer those questions. And if you really want to get her to talk, ask about those 16 children. <laughs> if you wanted to eat, I mean, she would just start telling you about her 16 children. You could wake up in the middle of the night and she would say, you must have Miss Cox, how many children? 16, and she would say with proud. I'd pass out. She said proudly, she had 16. One night my mother woke, she was incoherent. And my sister Mary and I was there, and we called, because I was there by myself, I panicked. We called. We called the paramedics, and they came, and they were asking her questions to check her responsiveness. That's the word for me, but responsiveness. And at first, we didn't get, we didn't panic. He held up three fingers, mama said two. <laughs> he asked her who we were, she didn't know. But then he said, Mrs. Cox, how many children do you have? And she said, six. And we said, my sister and I both at the same time with Mary. Y'all need to take her to the hospital. <laughs> Y'all need to take her to the hospital. She had 16 children. And they did they took her on to the hospital. And she stayed a few weeks. And that's and so who I'm gonna tell you who she was. I hope I don't take too long. I tried to tie this. I'm gonna tell you who she was. Take your time. On July the 23rd, 1934, a little girl was born to Addie B. Green. A little girl so sick that they did not give her a name because she wasn't expected to live. So I can imagine the midwife, yeah, the midwife, put your head back to me wrapping her in a blanket and handing her to her mother. Can you imagine holding your baby, knowing that it's not going to live? Yeah. And I'm sure she rocked her. And between the tears of sorrow, she prayed. And she <coughs> prayed. And God heard her prayer. There was a woman who practiced, I guess you call it herbal medicine. She made a tea for my mother. My mother had a fever. I don't know if it was rheumatic fever. Everything is, it's been a while. But she had a fever. And the lady made a tea. She made a herbal tea from the, from the, I say weeds, but I guess it was mullum leaves out of the garden, out of the field. And she made a tea and she gave it to this baby. She gave it to this baby day after day after day. And soon the baby started to get stronger and stronger. Then the woman named the baby. She named her Cosetta. Yes. Where did she live? Mm. My mother lives so many places. She lived in Benjamin Fields, Texas. Then her mother and stepfather moved to Carthage, Texas. Y'all don't hear the word a lot, Carthage, Texas. I'm gonna tell you right now. And they lived in Carthage, Texas. When she was about five years old, my mother, my grandmother, and aunt, and her sister Beatrice. You know how you go shopping for Easter? Excited? Sun is coming, you got to go that Easter outfit. They were walking, but back then you walked a lot. They were walking to town to go shopping. Hmm. My grandmother got sick. And her sister was able to stop a motorist to pick them up. They took them to Carthage, but they lived on the outskirts of Carthage. They took them to Carthage to a doctor's office. And of course, my grandmother died. She didn't get to live until her children were born, grown, sorry. But she knew the girls were left alone, but they weren't alone. She left a letter. Not to her sisters, you would think she had sisters, but she left it to her brother. She left a letter for her brother. And it was a good thing, because my stepfather, the police, was looking at him sideways. <laughs> so it was a good thing she left the letter. But the letter stayed for my uncle 
Lieutenant Grant to take the girls in the event of her death. And the sisters didn't like it. They felt that they should have kept it, especially my aunt, Alversi Tissue. She lived in Carthage, Texas. I think I'm going to you. She lived in Carthage, Texas. And then there was another lady, Bernie's Hall. Yes. She wanted her. That's the preacher's mom. Yeah. yeah. She wanted mom. Mama loved her. She hung around with her and everything. But because my grandmother knew she was ill, she, she built she left the letter, and the sisters, although they didn't like it, they honored her request. So she went to live with my uncle and his family. That was another move. She moved from Carthage to Marshall, Texas, where she lived with my uncle and his family. And over the years, things went smoothly. And just like any family, things happened. And it wasn't long before my uncle's family split. His wife and children moved to the, the Houston area. My aunt Beatrice, which is my mother's sister, she was grown, so she moved to Dallas. So that left no one at home but my mother and my uncle. So he worked nights, and he, would, he lived in the country, and he would come to Marshall. And because she was by herself, he would, he rented a room. <coughs> He rented a room in Marshall for her. And he brought her to town with him every night when he had to work. And she stayed in that room. Which, but then, oh, but then, she met my dad. She met dad. Yes, <laughs> yes. My uncle could have well, oh, you know, you lived here, but he. <laughs> God was with him. <laughs> another day. But she met my daddy, Frank Cox. Yes. He had been in the Army, and he lived with his father on a farm off the Walker Road. They, as you could say, dated, and eventually got married. And thus began the Cox clan. All right. <laughs> The family, my, the, the family continued to live with my grandfather on the block of road until that family started to ruin. There was John, Frank, Willie Dale, myself, Mary, Corina, and then there was my grandfather too. So daddy said, wait, I gotta, I gotta get another house. We gotta get a house. And mama had always wanted a house. He had promised her a house. So he said, it's time for me to get a house. So he moved on the land on Highway 31. Y'all remember that? Yeah. Highway 31 in Marshall, Texas. And he built a house. He took his army pension and he bought lumber and he stocked up and he built the house himself. Yes. And that's significant. Yes, it is. Yes, significant. Mm -hmm. My, he and my mother, then they moved and brought my grandfather with them. So my grandfather, he was our in-house babysitter. <laughs> <laughs> they built the house and they moved into the house. And then later, the other, the rest of the cops clan came along. <laughs> On Highway 31 was Shirley, Charles, Doretha, Emmett, who's deceased, Billy, Betty, Barbara, Sonia, and Nicole, and Hattie. <laughs> My mother took care of our grandfather, raised her children, helped my father on the farm. She would preserve the vegetables, can the fruit, make jams and jellies. My favorite preserve, oh, preserve, please don't let me get preserve. My favorite thing to eat that my mom made, as you can tell, <laughs> was hot biscuits yes, yes. and peppers. Oh, yes, yes. Woo! Yes. Yes. Mom wanted to get me happy. She said, pull out that jar of peppers yes. and make them hot biscuits right out the stove. Yes. I wasn't fit for nothing the rest of the day. Yes. <laughs> 
Yeah. <laughs> we, we worked on the farm, and it was, when you got to be old enough to follow mama around, you had to work on the farm. You had to go to the field. You had to do whatever mama, if you had to, you, we started out working with mama, and then she turned us on her own. However, we don't want to forget about my uncle. My uncle still looked out for my mother. This man was crippled, and he would, he lived in town off the old religious field road. You might familiar with Marsh. And he would catch a ride. He was crippled. He would catch a ride. He didn't drive. He would bring mama chicken, fish, every weekend. And he would sit there and visit with her, and she would cook. And then before, you know what they say, before the sun go down, he would catch a ride. And he'd go back to town. But as the years passed, my mother began to lose a lot of the people that she loved. Her uncle, her aunt, our grandfather. She was, she was left alone, but this time she wasn't alone. She had her children. She had her husband. But then on December 27th, 1992, my mother lost her husband, and we lost our father. She was so lonely without my father. She grieved for so long. She made us her life, but she continued to live on the land. And when she got to where our health started falling, and if I use the wrong word, I know my sister's going to tell me about it. Um, we started staying with her, taking care of her, doing things, helping her. And I'm not going to tell you every day was easy. What, what about that, Joyce? Every day was not easy. But we stayed so she could stay in her house. And as long as she was able to take care of herself somewhat, she was able to stay in her house. But then after fall, she went into the hospital and from the hospital to the nursing home. And she did, I think, several trips to the nursing home. And eventually, she was in the nursing home on Highway 31, Marshall. Then my mother moved on Copperville, Houston, Texas, with her daughter Shirley. Amen. Beautiful room, beautiful house. Yes. But she would say, <laughs> say it, family. It ain't, it ain't. What did she I say? Wanna I want to go home. I want to go home. She said, I want to go home. Then she moved on the Eisenhower. Yes. Tyler, Texas. Yes, yes. yes with she her did. daughter Barbara. Mm -hmm. The gospel singer. Yes. Beautiful home. Yeah. Beautiful room. Yes. View of the street. Yes. But what would she say, family? Wanna she wanna go home. She wanna stay with me. Home. <laughs> she wanna go we home. moved her back to Marshall yeah. to the nursing home. Round the clock care. Yeah. Family and friends dropping in. But what would she say, family? She wanted to go home. She told me she would come stay with me. Well, this is before she came to stay with me. When she was in a nursing home, and I want to thank them, a couple of my sisters came together and they decided, let's bring mama home. We will take care of her. What about that, son? Amen. We'll take Amen. care of her. Amen. What about Amen. that, Amen. Yes. We'll take care of her. Yes. And Shirley made it happen. Yes. Sister Shirley made it happen. We moved her back to the land, and when she got in that car, I was at a funeral, and I answered my phone, and I heard this voice say, I'm going home! <laughs> I said, what? Yeah. But she didn't go to her house, but she went on the land. She, she lived in a house that was previously occupied by my sister, Corina, mm -hmm. because she had moved to another city. Yes, yes. And the house was, it was a smaller, more easier to take care of and give her. But then she was satisfied. I won't say she was happy, because she told us she wanted to be in her house that her husband built yeah. Yeah. on the land Yes. <laughs> so she wasn't too happy with us for a little bit. 
But then she would come visit with me. Y'all, I know what I'm talking about, what I said, but I'm, I'm, I'm almost there. She would visit me during Christmas. And she loved coming, because she know, anytime you know you just go come for a visit, you okay. And she would come and she would visit, and we'd have a good time. I mean, I love those times. But the last time she was with me was during the COVID. And she said, Lavinia, you know, she called me Lavinia, I know what I told you. Yeah. She said, I want to go home. She said, if I'm going to die, I want to die on the land. I hurried up and got her packed up <laughs> and got her back to Highway 31, ain't it, John? Yeah. Highway 31 in Marshall, Texas, at yeah. 157 Private Road 1032. Yeah. yeah. I got her there. See, I'm almost there. I'm almost there. She was so happy. We pulled up. Carmen, you know how she'll do. She'll get out of the car. We pulled up. She said, let me just sit here. She sit there looking out at the land and looking around. And you know how she didn't like the house at first, but she was like, oh, it, it, it's so nice. It's so nice. It's so wonderful being here. That was the most contented I had seen her before. But during this last visit at the hospital in Christmas, Good Shepherd in Longview, I don't care what she got to where she couldn't really talk. But it's one thing you could hear her say. What'd she say to him? She want to go to Carthage. She want to go home. I want to go home. Yeah. So on Monday, July the 5th, the doctors came in and they said, why don't y'all take her home and make her comfortable? She was already in dialysis. They had taken her down there. And they came and they said, take her home. Make her comfortable. And my sister Shirley and I was sitting here, we were just, you can imagine how we felt. But old Tuesday morning, Tuesday morning, July 6th, we put her in that transport. And I always told my mama, where you go, I will go. Yes. And I followed that transport back to Marshall, Texas, back to the land on what highway did I tell y'all? Highway 31. 31. 31. 31. And on Tuesday morning, she was home. But oh, early Monday morning, July the 12th, she made her last move. Yeah. She made her last move and didn't have to pack up that. Yeah. She went to she went home early Monday morning. Early, early Monday morning. I had clocked in the work, Cassandra. <laughs> and my phone rang. My hand shook so I couldn't even call that the first time. I had to go back a second time. Yes. She went home to be with the Lord. Yes, she did. She died on the land near the house her husband built. Now I'm going to wrap up, y'all. I'm not going to try to hear you. Okay, who are my people? Okay, let's, let's do this quick. We can do this quick. I want all my brothers and sisters to say, these are her people. These are her people. All the brothers and sisters to say. Oh, yeah. Now, all the grandchildren can stand. And if you're not sure, stand in a way. Talk to your mom and get home. All the grandchildren. Okay, any great grand? Great grand. You're not sure, stand in a way. Talk to your mom and get home. Okay, now I know we got to hold the great, great grandchildren. <laughs> I'm in conclusion. I said great, great. I said hold them. I, I know they can't stand it. <laughs> oh, look, okay. All right. Okay. Thank y'all. For the baby girl who started with no name, here almost 87 years later, with her children all grown, is at home. She made a last move. Mama, you died on the land like you wanted. Rest in peace. We love you. We miss you. Your family. Amen. Amen. Thank you.
Yes, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. All right. It's all right. It's all right. Next, we're going to have a special tribute from her granddaughter, Aisha Ford, and Shade, Nicole. I don't know how to get that in the tucker. <laughs> Well, my Aileen said if you wanted to get Cosetta talking, ask about her 16 children. But if you really wanted to get her talking, ask about those grandchildren. Miss right Cosetta was crazy about her grandchildren, and we went the world to her. I was talking with some of my cousins this week, and we were all saying how hard it was to believe Grandma was gone. At first, a few tears would drop, but the more we talked, the more we laughed. That's when he hit me. Granny may be gone, but the memories we have can never fade away. Amen. Personally, I have one memory that really sticks with me when I think about my grandma. Every year, my aunties would go on their sister retreat, and they would leave me in charge to watch out for grandma. And they'll say, Bob, make sure grandma ain't eating nuts, she ain't supposed to be. And I say, okay, she not eating nuts, she ain't supposed to be. So we do that for Grandma said, come on, baby, let's bake a cake. Okay, Grandma. <laughs> we bake cake, we eat cake. So nobody knows what we need, Grandma. <laughs> a few other memories some of her grandchildren have with her are taking trips to Payless to buy as many shoes as they wanted, <laughs> making quilts, watching Tyler Perry movies over and over and over on the cheap, attending church services, and just talking to Grandma. On behalf of all of her grandchildren, we have just a short poem to present, and it's titled Memories. Memories are something that never fade. Just like Granny's love, we know our memories are here to stay. Our hearts are heavy, and we wish heaven wasn't so far away, but we know we have our memories to cherish each and every day. So our grandmother, we love you dearly, and we are so blessed for all the memories we have with you. Keep resting, Queen. All right. that you died twice. The first time is when the soul leaves the body, and the second time is when you don't hear your name anymore. Hmm. Let's keep Grandma's name alive and celebrate her by sharing her memory. She loved to quilt. She loved shopping. She took me one summer to pay less and bought me 10 pairs of shoes. <laughs> I was so happy. <laughs> she enjoys cooking. She has many recipes out there, and she loves family gatherings. I love you, Grandma, and you will be truly missed. Amen. So we have a friend that mother's other granddaughter, my Isha, Marsh, and now we're going to hear from Sade Nicole Tucker. But before she done, you know, I'm going to tell y'all something about this Payless. They keep saying Granny just done the Payless and bought them shoes. And y'all probably saying, Payless, what's the big deal? Well, they got their shoes from Payless. My 16 siblings and I, we got our shoes passed down. So I guess she's going to get in line with her friend's shoes. Um, I didn't get shoes from Payless, but what I did get, because if you know me, you know I like to eat. So Grandma would always sneak me something. I remember the last time we went to the fish place out here. I don't know where it is. Um, Grandma ordered a pie. She wasn't supposed to. I ain't tell nobody, but I had my fork. <laughs> and me and Granny ate that pie. So, you know, I like to eat, and I won't tell nobody that she ordered that because it was good. Thank you, Grandma. <laughs> <laughs> so, the poem is called Grandma. It's always sad but comforting to silently recall your smiling, dear, familiar face, so loved by one and all. For the world may keep turning and changing from day to day, but precious memories of you will never fade away. And here's hoping that this message, which carries so much love, 
will somehow, somehow find its way to you in heaven up above. It's to let you know, dear grandma, that although you are at rest, you're forever in the hearts of your grandchildren. For we love you the best. Love your grandbabies. Yeah, Mama put that seed in me. I think she did this in all of us. Okay, we're up to the point where we are going to hear remarks.